First of all, thank you to Sven for the invitation. And apologies, I don't know my abstract, I'm so disorganised, I forgot I didn't get in in time. But basically, I'm going to talk to you about microglia. Um, this conference is interesting for me because I'm actually, um, my, my research is really new at new generation, and I was at a dementia meeting in Valencia last week, and so it's quite nice for me to come to something which is a little bit less drastic, if you like. And to try and see how my research fits into this. So I apologise if this is sort of new generation, but we know, for example, that ageing is um, a risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease in the majority of cases, and also for the development of the majority of cases of diseases such as Parkinson's. So the processes of ageing are important for the development of these diseases. Let's see if I got this right. So microglia um, derived from egg sac, they're slightly different in their morphology from peripheral monocytes and macrophages, but they function as the immune, primary immune competent cell CNS. And they're the major cell type clustered around plaques and inclusions of brains in dementia, Parkinson's and whatever. But, and this is a list of all the different neurogenitive diseases where we have implications of microglial activation. But in all these cases, as well as in ageing, we see very early reactivity of microglia, long before there are any plaques, long before there are any inclusions visible. So they're activated very early on. So we want to find out what makes these cells change, what are the consequences for their interactions with neurons and glia, and how we can control this change to allow them to be uh, protective. Because years ago, I remember going to a talk and, and somebody, uh, I can't remember his name, but he said, oh yeah, they're little, pack, they're little bags of poison. But really, I mean, you don't develop with these cells in your brain to be toxic. They're there to um, surveil, they're there to pick up any infections and to migrate to areas of damage, clean it out and allow regenerative processes. But in ageing, they become um, what we call dysfunctional. And there's recent evidence that they're dystrophic and they may even be senescent. I'm not sure that the senescent data is actually that robust at the moment because it's all been done in post-mortem um, cells and so it's very difficult to say well how much of this is due to the fact that you've got end state and you know microglia are so reactive they react very easily I've never used post-mortem where I've really been confident about the data because as soon as you deprive microglia of oxygen and glucose they get reactive so it's very difficult to say that's exactly what they look like in at point zero of death because they do get very reactive. So we noticed quite a few years ago that when you activate microglia, they get a stress phenotype. And so it's interesting to me to find out whether in ageing are they stressed. And there's interesting um, data coming out now that they do change their morphology and they do change their phenotype. So we want to find out whether they switch from this protective phenotype, which is a predominantly M2 phenotype, to this neuroinflammatory toxic phenotype. So if, I'm not going to go through this because this is um, not enough time. So basically this is our data showing that when you show the mitochondrial polarity of these cells, this is a dye called JC1, which gets into the microglia, uh, if I can get it, no, on the left, top left, you see the, lip, the microglia all punctate and they're red, but on the bottom left, you see what happens after they're activated. The mitochondria all depolarize and they end up becoming, um, the, the nuclei change shape and they become apoptotic. Now, one of the things we found, can you see this? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you can get this caspase activation which drives gene expression and you get annexin 5 staining which suggests that their microglia are becoming apoptotic. But what we found is that because these cells have such a high um, generation of reactive oxygen species and nitro oxide, it causes microglial stress. And you get the upregulation of P53. And is this causing a sort of senescence phenotype? So this is the mitochondrial stress again. We're starting to see mitochondrial polarization. And we can find this when we activate through metabotropic glutamate receptors on these cells. And this is at quite low levels of glutamate. So just being surrounded by cells that are stressed, they release their glutamate and they can activate the microglia through their MGUR. So it's um, not a huge high concentration of 
glutamate is required for this. So they can get stressed by quite low levels of glutamate. They also produce superoxide. This is in human, at the top we've got a human Huntington's patients activated um, with a stressor LPS and they start producing superoxide as well as this mouse microbial cell line BB2 below. So they do produce significant amounts of intracellular superoxide as well as extracellular. Now we're interested, as I say, in this pathway, or I can't see, in this senescence pathway. And so the idea is that you get microbial in normal brain, they have a more of a M2 phenotype, and in the aging brain, they become um, more stressed, they um, become more senescent, but on the route to this senescence, they produce huge amounts of superoxide, nitric oxide, which gives this low intensity neuroinflammation, results in microglial stress and exhaustion. And this is from a, quite a recent paper by Stripe, but it fits in with some of our findings that as you age, your microglia are stimulated repetitively by a, a sort of low level low level uh, inflammation and this causes senescence. So we're interested in P53. Now one of the things, obviously most of us know about this in, with regard to cancer, but one of the uh, interesting papers to come out is this, and it's a, it's a sort of cancer and neurodegeneration. If you have inappropriate activation of P53, you start to see aging, you start to see neurodegeneration. It isn't like cancer where you have mutations. This is just a normal P53 inappropriately activated. So we looked um, some time ago and found that this to be the case in microglia. This is just um, some work of, um, just to show you that microglia express P53. This is in an HIV infected dementia patient and this is the work of Gwen Garden in Washington. So she, she found it in an extreme case of dementia. Um, so they do express P53. And this is our work here, talking about P53 and microglia, and I'm going to talk to you about this um, in a bit. Now, one of the ways that we can get P53 activation is by this repetitive stimuli. And one of the ways that this occurs is when you have, as I say, low-grade inflammation. Um, you can have it through um, aging, which is a sort of low stimulus to these microglia, or you can get it acutely through things like CNS injury, stroke, trauma, and neurodegenerative disease, which is a cumulative chronic condition. So we had a look at this, and we found that microglia express P53 when you activate them. Now, we've activated these cells with a number of uh, different activators, if you like. And one of these, chromogranin A, is found in dystrophic neurons. So when you age, your neurons um, get damaged, um, and the synapse, and you, you, as you just heard, synapses start disappearing, and they start to enclose unprocessed peptides. And chromogranin A is what we call a mother peptide. It's unprocessed. When it's exposed to microglia, they become reactive. We also expose them to amyloid beta, which, as you know, is uh, found in the amyloid plaques. But microglia in Alzheimer's disease can be exposed very early on to A beta, which isn't in plaques. Um, oligomeric form, and also they're shown to be reactive long before you see these um, peptides. So something's going on in the Alzheimer's brain long before you see plaques. LPS, LPS is a classic stimulator of microglia. It goes through toll-like receptor 4. TLR4s are actually, with aging, they show a drop in the expression. But the other, the compensatory mechanism for this is that you start to see more microglia, for example, in the hippocampus with aging. So there are cells with um, toll-like receptor 4 on them, there's just not so much expressed on the cell. But this, uh, when you activate in these ways, you get a, an pro-inflammatory M1 classical activation phenotype, they start producing inflammatory cytokines. And what we found is they start overexpressing their P53. And we can block this with this um, translocation inhibitor, pifithrin alpha. I just want to show you this, when we look at microglia and culture, they predominantly show an M, what we call an M2 phenotype, or a down-regulated phenotype, but one of the markers for this is arginase 1, so if you expose cells to arginase, or if you stain for arginase 1, you see them expressing this, and this goes down when you expose cells to LPS. 
IL-4 is uh, one way of shifting the phenotype to this M2 protective phenotype, and below we've got isolectin B4, which is a marker. So LPS switches this phenotype to um, this M1. So this is some images to show um, that we have microglia because we've got ED1 staining, but we also wanted to see, okay, we've got an upregulation of P53, but is it actually activated? So we use this phosphor P53 antibody, which shows that you're getting, um, you get two things with P53. One is that it becomes um, disassociated from its main regulator. It also becomes phosphorylated. But in order for it to act as this transcription factor, you need it to show phosphorylation, I think it's at serine 14 or 15, I can't remember plan. And this antibody recognises this. So we're seeing reactive phospho P53 when we activate microglia. This is just to show that this regulates ion loss expression. Ion loss expression is extremely important in microglia because of the amounts of nitric oxide produced by these cells. We also see that we can regulate the um, release of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-1-beta if we modulate the expression of P53. And it's been shown in Greg Garden's work that it's not mediating death per se, it's mediating gene transcription on a whole range of pro-inflammatory cytokines in these cells. But it's also regulating um, apoptotic, oh, and I'm not really sure if it's senescence, I've got to check, I've been talking with people here, which has been quite interesting about how you can tell whether you're getting real senescence. And I don't know whether you do see sen an, an XM5 expression in senescence, and maybe somebody can tell me about that. But we do see death of the microglia. But we also see that the bottom graph here is showing when we add or activate microglia within neuronal cultures, we see protection if we first block the P53 mediated pathways in the microglia. So if you block P53, you not only stop microglial stress pathways, but you also stop the consequential neuronal damage. So this is just to show that we're getting neuronal damage here with um, microglia, and if we block P with P53 and alpha, we don't. And we used a, another um, block of P53 to, to work out the difference between the activation of P53, the nuclear translocation of P53, and the activation of P53 into the mitochondria. And P53 mu is supposed to have no activities on um, transporting or blocking the transport of P53 into the nucleus, it's supposed to bind to P53, blocking its translocation and activation of mitochondrial mediated apoptotic pathways. So P53 mu here did not have any effect on the fluorescent, uh, the toxic cascades, the inflammatory cascades, and the microglial death mediated by transcriptional activation of P53, and it didn't block neuronal death. So it's mediating P53 in the nucleus. Now, as you just heard, the synapse loss is one of the earliest um, indicators of, <coughs> neuronal de of neuronal loss. And it's, as I found out in the meeting last week in dementia, it's one of the early and most powerful ways of showing cognitive decline. It starts very early and it correlates with cognitive decline, both in aging and neurodegeneration. So we looked at the expression of two markers, synaptic markers, one of these is synaptophysin, it's at the, um, in the synaptic vesicles, it's highly expressed, it's one of the most prevalent synaptic markers you can find, and it's lost in neurodegeneration and it's lost in ageing. And we found that if you activate microglia, expose the cell neurons to microglia, you get loss of synaptophysin long before those neurons die. And you can block this by blocking P53 activation in microglia, but not um, the mitochondrial mediated pathways. And if we eliminate all the microglia in the cultures with LME, this is a really nice way of getting rid of microglia. It's a lysosomal toxin, so it just wipes out the microglia. We don't get this synaptophysin loss. If we then look at another one, this is Drebrin. Now, Drebrin is Drebrin A in particular, but its antibody recognises A and B. This is also um, lost in early stage of ageing, and again, is a, cognitive, a, a positive correlation with ageing and neurodegeneration. This is a postsynaptic marker and it's important for, for example, um, spine um, integrity um, in the hippocampus for what, uh, and other areas of the brain. 
So we looked at this and we saw in parallel with synaptophysin that we lose um, treberin. And again, if we block P53 mediated pathways in the microglia, we protect and we don't lose um, these synapses. Okay, so this is imaging of um, excitosis. And this is a dye which, when you stimulate neurons, goes in to the synaptic vesicle. So you get an uptake of this um, FM143 sterile dye. It's lipophilic and it goes, and as you get withdrawal of the synaptic vesicle membrane back into the neuron, it labels the inside of the synapse. So this is a, is a synaptic, this is showing where all the synapses are in this um, neuronal culture. It, it's beautiful to work with, I mean, it's just fantastic stain. And when you stimulate, again, you get excitosis, um, and you can measure this as a decline in the fluorescence. <coughs> so on the top left, we see what's happening when the dye is taken up. So that's showing you all the areas where you're getting excitosis, endocytosis. And on the left, uh, the top right panel of the fluorescence images, we're seeing the control um, excitosis once we've stimulated. And you can see this decrease in the dye, which is what you would expect when you're getting excitosis, endocytosis, excitosis cycling. On the bottom left, if we expose microglia to LPS and then we, um, we add that condition medium, in this particular case, to the neurons, you get a decrease in the ability of these cells to take up at this dye. So it's showing that their synapses are becoming dysfunctional. <coughs> and on the right bottom, you see what happens when we decrease this. And we can block this with pifithrin alpha acting on the microglia. So we can recover this loading and this de-staining back to controls when we, um, when we use pifithrin alpha. We don't get the protection when we use pifithrin mu. So these pathways mediate, um, P53 mediates damage. So I just want to quickly go on to something that we talked about briefly yesterday about uh, immune senescence and immune cells in ageing. Now there's a number of papers that have recently come out uh, and I'm collaborating with John Hardy, the Institute of Neurology, to look at this. And what's been shown is when you do um, GWAS analysis of patients, because the problem with um, Alzheimer's disease, even though we know that in 20% of the cases you've got late onset, early onset, this is one where you don't. This is, and this is a misfunction of um, TREM2, which is present on microglia, there are mutations in TREM2 which, which modulate the function. And what we think is happening is that you're getting loss of the ability of phagocytosis, um, high levels of cytokine production, the inability to clear phagocytic cells, and the inability to phagocytose, for example, A beta. And then in conjunction with this, you're seeing modulation in another receptor, complement receptor 1. And these are loss of function mutations. And what we're trying to do now is use, um, these are patient fibroblast iPSCs. And we've recently set up microglial iPSC-derived um, patient fibroblast iPSCs from human to see if we can modulate this. So we're going to have control and defective microglia. And we're going to work out what's going on with these different microglia. So, uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there. These are the people that did the work, my collaborators. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Do we have any questions? Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, you put your voice up in a small room. So, um, I saw on one of your slides, but I didn't see exactly what was, um, you know, yeah. the, the, I couldn't see it, but I saw lithium chloride mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so, as you know, lithium chloride has been shown in multiple studies to be protective against Alzheimer's disease, yeah. often claimed inhibiting GSK3 beta and preventing TAR hyperphosphorylation. But could it maybe also inhibit uh, activation of microglia? Yeah, I mean, we, we use it to, when we first started this work, we, we sort of found that P53 can be blocked. The activation of P53 can, in, the, in the literature could be blocked by lithium chloride, so that's why we used it. So yes, um, obviously it's got a lot of targets that, well, more specific targets, but we did find that it blocked the increase in P53. And so yeah, it could well do. And um, yeah, yeah, I don't know.
could block the psychosis that you see in Alzheimer's disease, I don't know, but it's a bit messy, which is why we didn't pursue it. So um, we looked at slightly more specific. Yeah, quite exciting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, sorry. So we looked at more specific inhibitors. So yeah, it could be. Slide. Yeah. I think I have a call like you. So in one of your first uh, slides you showed that the number of microglia decrease with aging. Is that true? Well, it is in certain <coughs> areas, but in the hippocampus there's an increase initially. I mean, I, I think the, dead, the, the jury is still out about whether, you know, a lot of these studies where you see an increase in microglia are in rat studies when they look at the hippocampus and they say, yeah, there's an increase in the number of microglia. So, so it could be more a, a qualitative difference yeah. with ageing than, than the numerical or yeah. quantitative. So basically, the idea might be that you're getting stress in the microglia that are, are resident and getting recruitment of microglia, because we don't know what the population, whether we're getting different populations, but you, you could be getting recruitment externally, because we know that, for example, blood-brain barrier damage occurs a lot earlier than you think. In, for example, Alzheimer's disease, you know, you look at the classic MS, and that's the one where all the microglia go in, but actually, it might actually be occurring earlier. So you could be getting recruitment of microglia, either from different areas of the brain or from uh, the external. periphery. Yeah, just so, from peripheral one yeah, yeah, so <coughs> the number of microglia might, might be higher, but the actual quality of the of their, you know, their production of uh, neurotrophins mm -hmm. is lower. But there's also changes in the, the cortex. I just read a paper recently where normally that microglia have their own little domains and they spread out, but in the cortex they start to clump. Yeah. And then, so there are areas where you're not getting this, this nice, healthy surveillance. So areas, you know, it depends where you look, there are changes. So in our human studies, we see that with aging, uh, the innate um, arm of the immune response, actually the number of cells increases. Right. Like we see more monocytes, more NK cells. Yeah. So yeah. that could, if they are recruited from that source, that could be. Yeah. So what about, for instance, the LPN stimulation in the human situation? Is that indeed, um, how, how does it get into the brain and is that also linked with microbiota and well, leaky gut? And yeah, yeah, exactly. Like um, we don't know, we're just using it as a tool to activate a particular pathway, but if you look at Hugh Perry's work, what he's saying is that if you get systemic infection in aging or particularly in neurodegeneration, I mean I've seen it with my, when my father had dementia, he, you get a bladder infection for example and the cytokines go through the roof and they really affect your cognitive function. So it could possibly be that you know that will play on the role of, of microglia. We're, we're just using it as a way of, of stimulating these cells but we're kind of getting away from that now, and as I say, we're going into this TREM2 um, modulatory pathway. But that in itself can, is, that, is like a lock. So if you've got any sort of stimulus, it does actually form a lock on the, on the propensity of the microglia to become inflammatory. So defects in that, if you've got LPS or if you've got anything that will affect, I mean, tall like receptors, they're not just, you know, they're, they're pants basically. They will, they will bind any motif that fits with that receptor. So we're just using it as a way of of activating that sort of molecular motif, if you like. But there is evidence that TLRs um, do it decrease with aging, or their, their ability to signal properly does decrease with aging. How that does it, we don't know. 